Random exercises. Question. Some groups of Sufis and others carry out frequent and regular exercises, dances, and all sorts of activities in which everyone takes part. Why do you say that one should not do the things which have brought others into high spiritual states? Answer. First, please note that there are always plenty of people who carry out automatic processes, and they are always glad to get others to join them. If you know of anyone and you want to join them, you will be likely to do so. If you do, you can make your own test of whether this is the best way of going about things. In other words, why are you here if you can get these things elsewhere? Secondly, assuming that you are here because you want first to compare what we say with what other people say, I can only repeat that what suits one person at one time does not inevitably suit another. Language of Birds There is a story which preserves this by analogy. A worthy man once prayed that he might know the language of the birds. One day, when he was sitting quietly under a certain tree with a bird's nest in it, he realised that he could follow the meaning of their chirruping. One bird was telling another that the king's son was ill and that human beings were so stupid that nobody knew that by giving him lemon water he would be saved. The man immediately went to the royal court, where he found that the young prince was indeed ill and his life was despaired of. He prescribed lemon water and the prince recovered. The king ordered that the doctor be rewarded with as much gold as he wanted. Now this worthy man had a friend who was very unworthy indeed, and he confided to him the way in which he had become rich. So the unworthy man prayed that he might be able to understand the language of the birds, as he wanted to become rich like his friend. The faculty developed in him. Sitting under a tree, he heard the birds talking. They said, Under this tree is sitting an unworthy man who wants our secrets. We shall let him have one of them. It is that, at this very moment, a ravenous tiger, whom we have called from the jungle to eat him up, is advancing upon him. As he stood up to run, the unworthy man was seized by the tiger and devoured. Why should one not do the things which have brought others into high spiritual states, the questioner asks. If one were a machine, and if all people and situations were alike, if people were pieces of wood to be shaped, of course, one should neglect all the manifold attendant circumstances and apply exercises randomly. This question implies that everything is always the same. Reflection might well have told our questioner otherwise if he had but turned the question around so as to use his own thinking capacities. By turning the matter over in one's mind, the question might become, under what circumstances would it be true that random exercises should not be carried out, or mechanical imitation should be shunned. One very good reason not to steal exercises and apply them randomly, which means without insight and knowledge, is that this can have the same sort of effect in its own sphere as other more familiar forms of theft. Sometimes this, as in the example I am now going to give you, carries its own penalty. Here is the parallel, and humorous though it may be from one point of view, you should laugh at it and look for the additional dimension of instruction. It is a good equivalence of what can happen to people who adopt metaphysical things and then wonder what has happened to them, or why nothing has happened. What he stole The London Daily Telegraph of the 27th of October 1976 reports that a housebreaker stole a local councillor's checkbook and identification pass and used them in shops. His intention was to get money and goods. What did he get? His defence lawyer explained in court, in every single one of the nine shops which he visited, identifying himself as the councillor, he was assailed by complaints about the public services. At one stage, to get out of a shop, he even left his telephone number for a lady shop assistant to contact him about the transfer of a house. 
He was found guilty of forgery and housebreaking, but the disparity between his expectation and the reality was due to the fact that he made assumptions about what would be likely to happen if he did certain things, and his ignorance was his undoing. If people know about the effects of these exercises, they do not need to ask such questions as we have here. If they do not, it cannot be explained to them better than through an allegory such as this, taken from real life. I like the headline to the account. It is, The Thief Who Stole Another Man's Burden. If in doubt, have them out. Random exercises are more likely than not to have the effect which taking Mullah Nasruddin's advice would have had, in this example of his wisdom. Nasruddin, you are a man of experience, said a philosopher. Have you heard of a cure for aching eyes? I read a lot, and mine are giving me trouble. All I can say is, replied the mullah, that I once had pain in two teeth. It did not stop until I had them both out. On the lines of a school. Question. When is a student in a school, and when is he only working on the lines of a school? Answer. When you are in a school and not working along the lines of a school, you are not effectively in a school at all, are you? If you are in a workshop and you are fast asleep, it is effectively a bedroom, is it not? When you are working on the lines of a school, you are in a school. The only kind of working that I can think of in which it could be said that you are only working along lines is if you are being imitative. For instance, I would call working on lines as near as I can interpret the phrase as pretending to do something, as when one might be amusing oneself while imagining that one is doing something more useful or important. But I would not use your turn of phrase to describe this condition, since I assign a technical term value to the word working. Working means to me doing what a school does and not pretending to do it or inventing reasons or interpretations for it. In this kind of working, it is the relationship between the people and the activity which constitutes the work, and this work cannot but be along the right lines. If I wanted to look at this question so as to obtain some sort of study advantage from it, I would have to rephrase and to make a general kind of statement, like People want to learn. What tends to prevent most of them, consequently at best providing considerable delays in learning, at worst a distorted kind of activity for personal and group amusement, is the maintenance of disabling tendencies, manifested by greed to learn, lack of self-observation, desire for social esteem beyond a reasonable amount, reluctance to learn creating a desire to fantasize instead, personal overvaluation or impatience resulting in attempting to achieve a relevant or premature target. Sufi study must be real, not imitation. Working on lines is imitation. To be engaged in the work of a school, the student must be able to approach this definition, given by Abul Hassan Nouri, that the aim is to achieve freedom and generosity and abandoning unnecessary burdens, weakness of mind, and liberality with the world. As Hujwiri explains, this means that to attain to real Sufi status, freedom includes the leaving off of the influence of attachments, what we would call the effects of conditioning and meanness, and giving those things which belong to mundane estimation generously, as it would appear, to those who prize them. This is the reality without a name in Abul Hassan Fushanji's memorable cry over a thousand years ago. Being a Sufi today is a name without a reality, and formerly it was a reality without a name. People constantly insist that, since information and knowledge about Sufi principles and practices are so widespread, all that is needed is to put them into practice. And yet one sees almost every day how the really sad thing about supposedly serious people 
is that they actually disdain to learn from things which they regard as trivial, but which have important lessons for them if they would only see. The fact is that they do not see, and that is why there has to be a real school to make sure that all appropriate actions and teachings are observed. The tale of the emperor's new clothes, of course, teaches that one should be able to learn from any source and not reject it when it is not interesting enough to you, or if it lacks a million dollars, or a PhD, or mighty arms, or a spiritual reputation. It is characteristic of humanity, which includes people trying to work on the lines of a school, that while all necessary knowledge or information may be present, people either take no notice of it, or only adopt such parts as they please. This current example from the Times of London from the 18th of November 1976 puts it in a nutshell. Just because it is about eating and not about other intakes, however, how many people will spot the parallel? The German Society for Nutrition checked 50,000 households to see how people ate. In spite of widespread public information about wrong diet and overeating, it was found that the damage done to health through wrong eating habits stands annually at 17,000 million Deutschmark, 4,250 million pounds, or 7,225 million dollars. The damage done by smoking and drinking is only 3,000 million Deutschmarks a year, in contrast. One West German in two is overweight. All categories of people get the wrong balance and quantities of calories and proteins. Only 10% of the populace are their correct weight. Almost everyone gets too few vitamins. Like all the other parallels which one notes, this is not intended to single out a specific community, in this case Germans, for we may find similar equivalent data everywhere. Conduct teaching Question we read about people spending time with Sufi teachers, and we know that Sufis may remain in contact with those who want to learn for periods of years. Many accounts of the lives and actions of Sufi teachers and their interactions with disciples, and also members of the ordinary public, have been constantly published, originally in the East and more recently widely in the West. What is the purpose of the conduct teaching of the Sufis? as distinct from the purpose of spiritual exercises or explanations and admonitions? Answer. Interaction teaching between a teacher and a learner has many aspects. One which is perhaps the most readily grasped but very neglected in understanding by students is that the impacts, stimuli and activities devised by the Sufi are intended to illustrate behaviour and expose subjective reactions. Great Sufis shocked people, for instance, to let them experience the narrowness of their own cast of mind. Sufis continue to shock narrow-minded people, though there is, of course, no guarantee that such people will benefit from this experience. Sometimes mere onlookers benefit instead. Remember that the definition of a learner is one who learns, not one who thinks that he is a student. How the Sufi goes about this program, what he says and does, what he does not say or do, will depend upon local conditions, as you can see in the traditional literature. Sufism, as has been said by one of the ancient sheikhs, was formally imparted by signs alone. This requires a learner who can read signs. Similarly, with the introduction of literature, experiences of one kind and another can be imparted illustrated and so on by literature, or partially through the written and spoken word, as well as through conduct. Benefiting from this will depend upon whether the student is in alignment with the material. He generally is not, being too greedy for truth and progress to develop the basic calm and relative humility towards the materials to do more than consume them as emotional stimuli, which he could have done with anything. Sheikh Ibrahim Ghazur Ilahi, among the Sufi directors, has emphasized that when the teacher has finished his own journey, he repeats it again and again, each time with one learner. 
This is referred to as the analogy of the seed being in the plant and the plant in the seed. The conduct teaching of the Sufis has to be adapted to the students and cannot be a mechanical thing applied to all people in exactly the same way. Question. But since this information is so generally available and is contained in the works of the great Sufi teachers, why do more people not seek it? Answer. This has always been a fact. It is answered today as always by the observation, the wise know because they have paid for their wisdom. You do not accept their counsel because it is offered for so much less than they have paid for it. Conduct teaching has many other dimensions after the stage of showing people to themselves. One might quote it as equivalent to the situation referred to by Blackett when he said, A first-class laboratory is one in which mediocre scientists can produce outstanding work. The conduct situation enables people who have some potentiality to excel themselves. In this kind of situation, too, People are encouraged to learn in the manner in which they can do so, not in the manner which they try to impose on the subject. In the scientific parallel again, Mackay says, We shall have to learn to refrain from doing things merely because we know how to do them. Conduct teaching is often reported in real and devised anecdotes. Mullah Nasruddin's stories often show this characteristic, reflecting both on the conduct of the wise and that of the stupid, in addition to their other and more internal dimensions. One such story, designed to be used as a paradigm in life situations, is this. The Man Vine Some men were planting vines, and Nasruddin asked them what they were doing. Digging these in so that they will produce fruit. That is exactly what I would like, said the mullah, so please plant me and I will bear fruit. After as many objections as they could think of, the men were prevailed upon to do as Nasruddin asked. Not long afterwards they saw him walking about. One of them said, We told you that you can't grow fruit by being planted like that. You haven't proved it yet, said Nasruddin for I only uprooted myself for a bit because I was cold, not because I'm not going to produce fruit.